Hello and welcome to an introduction to matrix isolation. Uh, this is a product of the chemistry information retrieval class at Drexel University. Uh, this video will be divided up into several parts, uh, mostly because of a disagreement between myself and the recording software, which will also probably distort uh, some of the colors of the images. Uh, but I found that most of it is bearable, uh, especially the, the key content should get across. So uh, let's have a look at this rendition uh, on our title slide here of what matrix isolation might look like. Uh, the little clear gels uh, that take up most of the screen there are your actual matrix species, and they are trapping some of the other molecules there, uh, which are known as our uh, guest species or our target species that we want to study. And it looks like the one on the right there is actually undergoing uh, some hydrogen bonding interactions. So here's an overview of the presentation. Uh, we're going to go through some of the background information, including the history and uh, the inventor of matrix isolation. And we'll go through some of the goals that that inventor had in mind. And then we'll follow up with the experimental setup, including an actual parts diagram, some of the experimental conditions and deposition methods, and last but certainly not least, uh, the detection options available to you, of which there are a lot. Uh, like any uh, technique, there are some drawbacks to it and some challenges to matrix isolation, and we'll see how some scientists have actually handled these challenges uh, when we look at some of the brief inorganic case studies that I have here at the end of the presentation. And then uh, I'll show you some of the reference material so you can see where I got all this stuff from. Here's a little background information for you on the late George C. Pimentel, the so-called father of matrix isolation. He graduated from UCLA in 1943 and he joined the Manhattan Project immediately uh, at Berkeley. Uh, but when he kind of realized, you know, just how terrible uh, and the destructive nature of the project, he actually decided to join up in the U.S. Navy instead. Uh, and once the war was over, he returned to Berkeley for his Ph.D. in 1946 under Kenneth Pitzer. And he actually graduated only three years later in 1949, which is pretty astonishing, uh, considering all the standards required for that kind of degree and he immediately joined the faculty at Berkeley and was an active member until his death in 1949. His first paper uh, published on matrix isolation came out in 1954 in one of the journals of physical chemistry and last but uh, kind of one of the neater factors that I didn't know about before I made this was that matrix isolation is actually part of biennial conferences with chemistry and physics at low temperatures so I thought it was pretty neat that it had its own little niche. Okay, let's go over some of the goals of matrix isolation. Uh, it can be summed up in a nutshell as uh, an attempt to study unstable species, of which there are a lot of conditions that make things unstable, so let's have a look at some of them. First is reactive intermediates. Uh, any kind of step that happens, especially in a mechanism, that you know takes place but happens so fast, uh, you know, that it's difficult to actually comprehend. Those kinds of things can be studied by matrix isolation, as well as radical species. Uh, if you have any kind of chemistry background, you know how reactive those are. You can also get some short-lived charge species, both cationic and anionic, uh, for study. Also, hydrogen bonding can have some pretty awesome chemistry that you can observe under matrix isolation conditions. Some of the more exotic stuff now, you can do high temperature vapor species, uh, some low energy molecules, uh, especially uh, conformers, tautomers, and rotomers uh, that are not thermodynamically favorable that you wouldn't normally see. Sometimes you can trap a couple of these in a matrix and actually observe uh, different spectra on those. You can also monitor energy decay and uh, relaxation and transfer of molecules, as well as uh, create some photochemically induced species and really check those out before they die out too quickly. Now some of the top ones you'll notice that are relatively common and easy to come by, but some of the lower ones are um, pretty, some of the lower on the list are actually pretty uncommon and require a lot of different conditions. You actually have to uh, monitor the last two in the actual matrix box, which can be quite a challenge.